When most people think about luxury segment cars, you typically think of German cars with uh, prestige badges. But I'm willing to hazard a guess that there's uh, a company out there that can perhaps make a car that's um, better equipped and in many ways more refined, but for a fraction of the cost. This is the Renault Safran. Now to the untrained eye you could easily confuse a Safran for something like a Renault Laguna uh, but don't be fooled because this car is actually substantially bigger than the uh, Laguna which sat directly below it. Um, now the Safran was um, quite conventionally styled, obviously a five door hatch in a segment that is normally saloons but other than that um, Renault really were quite sedate with the styling on this car. Uh, now this is a facelift example so the front end is a little bit different, we've got a different grille on here to the front cars which was a slimmer grille um, with the diamonds sort of protruding up out. By this point as well we've got the uh, plastic headlamps which in this car have got this sort of grey trim around the edge, that's really a nice touch, I do quite like that as well. Obviously colour coded bumpers uh, with this black trim here and a chrome strip uh, and then we've got our fog lamps mounted down there as well along with this um, sort of grey splitter which was common on Renaults of that era. Uh, moving around the vehicle, rubbing strips and uh, grey sills down the side here and um, we've got the all important 2.5 litre badge which we'll discuss a little bit more about that later on and our uh, badge to tell us that this is indeed the executive trim specification. Now as I said this car is indeed the facelifted model so again the rear end is revised uh, on the earlier cars this had more of a sort of trailblazer uh, style light which kinked up here and continued across the back uh, but they've just softened it up smoothed it off for this facelift uh, model but we've still got the light split here um, with some mounted to the rear, um, rear fenders and then this other section here which is actually mounted in the tailgate itself. This car also has the boot spoiler fitted as well which again is a really nice touch. Uh, something else I actually really like on this car is the colour. Uh, this is Monaco Blue. Now Monaco Blue was available on quite a few um, Renaults for many many years um, and it's just one of those colours whichever Renault I've seen it on it doesn't matter whether it's a Clio, um, a Megane or something like this Safran. It just seems to suit really really well. So with Safran Renault were really keen to try and shake the uh, image that they had of the car has been a little bit flaky, even the flagship 25 that preceded this, um, as nice a car as it was, it was said that build quality probably weren't as good as what it could have been. Uh, but the Safran, a much weightier car, uh, nice solid thud when I close the door there, um, rather than conventional door pockets we've got this big padded um, armrest here with storage bins inside there, a big chunky door pull with uh, four electric window switches, um, a lockout button and our electric mirror controls. Above that we've got our uh, door handle, now at this time they were still using plastic as opposed to metal um, but it is a big chunky solid um, plastic so um, and obviously this car is now approaching 25 years old and that still feels nice and solid. Um, a really nice touch here we've got this wood trim that's inserted into the door um, and it actually curves around and meet, flows into the dashboard. Um, that then continues on the passenger side along this uh, line here and into the passenger side door. Really really nice touch and it really does add a little extra something to the cabin. Dashboard itself as I say in the corners it's sort of um, kinks towards you, sort of wraps around a little bit um, and blends really nicely into this door card. The main section of the dash, well we've got this big uh, plinth across the top which does remind me of the uh, 25 before, although that did have its air vents mounted up there as well. The um, instrument cluster is fairly comprehensive with a um, temperature gauge to the right, 160 mile per hour speedo next to that, a fuel gauge top dead center and a rev counter to the left of that which actually reads to 7000 rpm uh, with its red line starting at 6250. The um, smaller gauge to that is for our uh, oil. Now we've also got two LCD displays um, mounted in here as well. One of them is your um, conventional mileometer, trip meter um, and a uh, gear indicator uh, being that this is an automatic. 
The um, rev counter has an LCD display and that houses the trip computer uh, for things like fuel economy um, and information like that. Um, to the left of there in the centre we've got these uh, two vents um, which actually do push down flush onto the dash um, and then flip up. The, um, now I know on some cars it's said that these can um, sort of weaken over time and then they'll drop down and you'll have trouble getting them to stay up. Uh, not an issue on this particular car though. Um, above that we've got our radio display um, and a couple of buttons here. Now I know on some versions um, there is a voice synthesizer as well and that will give you information such as if the um, door is open for example or any other issues with the vehicle it will give you an audible um, warning um, tell you anything that needs um, that the car needs. Welcome. The vehicle computer is now checking systems for you. Um, below there we've got our climate control. Now climate control wasn't something that was particularly common uh, outside of the executive uh, segment back in the day, um, but would be right at home in a car like this. Um, you've got dual zone as well so you can set separate temperature for driver and passenger. Dropping down into the centre here, um, between these two buttresses we've got our audio equipment, now it's a double DIN slot, um, we've got a single DIN CD radio head unit in this particular car. Um, I must admit the pre-facelift cars, you could actually get a double DIN uh, radio uh, cassette CD player with a graphic equaliser. Um, now in many ways the Phase 2 is probably a far better car, but um, I must admit it did look um, quite cool with that system installed. Um, below that we've actually got a flap as well above there if you want to cover all this up uh, and there's another storage area at the bottom here in front of the gear lever. Now something uh, worth note there was another trim level above this executive specification. Um, it didn't add a lot of equipment it was called the Questa um, and you would have gained electrically operated um, seats in that car um, which were actually available as an option on this executive trim. Uh, but the other thing you would have got as standard with the Questa is a satellite navigation which really wasn't something that was common um, in the late 1990s. The um, screen for that would have been mounted down here, um, although I have actually seen um, pictures of some Safrans, I'm not sure whether they were UK market cars, where these vents were double stacked and there was a display up here, um, higher up on the dashboard. Now these centre consoles, um, apparently they can become a bit sticky on these. I don't know why. Um, this one doesn't seem too bad actually. Um, but yeah, that's something I've heard it can be an issue with some Safrans. Now dropping down here into the middle, um, we've got our automatic transmission. Um, we've got another button on there as well um, if we want to put the car into sport mode. Uh, conventional handbrake and we've got this lovely little carpeted uh, cubby hole down there as well which is quite nice. Centre armrest, um, centre armrest in this car trimmed in leather um, and in the top of there we've got some storage um, which you could fit I don't know maybe three or four CDs in one side and some cassette tapes uh, we've also got a little coin holder there as well for your toll money or your parking change. And up top here driver and passenger sun visors and we've actually got this is quite neat. We've got a little uh, sun visor in the middle as well, above the mirror, so you can use that to um, black out those little bits that uh, often get missed, which is quite nice. Um, centre console here with a swivel map light, infrared sensor for the central locking, um, switch gear for our electric sunroof, um, lighting and uh, central locking. Now the dashboard to the near side of the car sort of slopes away um, with a shelf area on top. No glove box in Safran though, I'm, I'm not entirely sure um, why that is, why they couldn't fit one, but uh, yeah, the car doesn't have a glove box. Um, what it does have though is um, driver and passenger airbags. Now Safran was actually the first car in the Renault range to have airbags fitted as standard. Now, just a few other things to note on this car around the steering uh, wheel area. Behind the steering column we've got our radio controls, pretty familiar to anyone with a Renault today. Um, by the late 1990s this was um, pretty much standard on most cars in the Renault range. Um, it, again, it originated with the Renault 25 back in the 1980s, so uh, yeah, nearly two decades before other manufacturers started including this equipment on their cars.
Uh, we've also got some switch gear on the steering wheel uh, and this is for the cruise control because again it's an executive specification car um, and that would have been something quite popular to have on a car in this segment. Now being the segment of car um, you expect it to be as nice in the back as it is in the front and uh, yeah the Safran doesn't disappoint. I've got the same um, elephant hide on the doors, the same wood trim here with an ashtray and our electric window switch, um, lovely padded armrest there, uh, but we've got conventional door pockets in the back of here. Um, we've got our um, speakers mounted in the bottom of the doors here as well, um, map pockets on the back of both seats as well. Now, um, I'm about five foot nine. Um, I've got about two inch of headroom here. Um, one thing I would be aware of though is how this slopes. I, as you can see, I'm actually sat back in my normal position here uh, and this uh, pillar is actually directly at the side of my head. Something I wouldn't have really been um, that aware of from the outside, but once I sit in, yeah, I, I, that is um, quite noticeable. Um, the doors themselves though are actually quite long in the Safran, so it makes getting in the car quite easy. As you can see, I've got quite a lot of leg room in here as well, which uh, doesn't really come as much of a surprise. Um, actually more than enough room. Now again, the seat upholstery back here is trimmed out in leather. We've got um, two headrests here in the back of the car as well. And uh, we've also got this large uh, centre armrest here. Um, and there's also a little pouch, a pocket on the back of there as well. Uh, no cup holders back here, but again, I think we're just a little bit too early for that sort of thing. But it's not just space in the back of the Safran that um, lifts it above other cars of the time. We've actually got two um, adjustable air vents down here in the back of the car. Um, we've also got a power point as well. Um, and above that, our cigar lighter, because again, um, French 1990s ashtrays and uh, cigar lighters are just pretty much standard for equipment. Um, above my head here, we've actually got um, some reading lights as well, which, with a little switch there, which is nicely done. Now, there were some versions of the Safran which actually had electrically adjustable rear seats as well. Um, again, not fitted on this car. Um, I believe that was actually optional on the Phase 1 cars. But I'm not sure if that was actually carried over to Phase 2 cars or not. Uh, maybe if you know, let me know in the comments. It would be quite interesting to know that sort of thing. In 1992, Renault released a replacement for their aging 25 model. Now the 25 was a nice car, uh, but it did have a bit of a reputation for some quality issues. So with the Safran, Renault built a car that was much bigger and heavier, with a lot more sound deadening, um, and structurally a lot more rigid as well than the uh, outgoing 25. Now Renault actually invested 800 million pounds um, in the development of the Safran of which half of that budget was spent in the factory where the cars were built. So the car was built for the executive segment, um, but it was obviously built with an executive mindset as well, because uh, Renault actually employed a just-in-time uh, system in their factory where um, completed dashboards and other components were all ordered up to arrive at the production line just in time for the uh, to meet the car as it went down the assembly line, uh, much like Tesla do with their cars today. Now in the initial phase one car, um, there were quite a few different versions available, uh, but I'm not going to go into all of them with the exception of one model. But instead I'm going to focus on the cars we've got here in the UK, which were predominantly petrol versions of the car, um, with two litres, 2.2 litres, and a range topping 3 litre V6 engine. Now the 3 litre V6 um, was available with a 4-speed automatic transmission. Uh, other engines were available with an automatic or a manual. The problem with those Phase 1 cars is um, they were the first Renault to have a uh, cable-operated gear linkage on the manual cars, uh, and they were criticised for being a little bit sloppy. The automatics, on the other hand, well, they were known for dumping the transmission oil, um, not something you really want in your uh, expensive executive car. But by 1996, Renault released the uh, facelift version of the car, uh, which is what this is. These ran until 2000, um, where it was retired at the time with no direct replacement, um, until the uh, Velsatis and Aventime came along a few years later. But that's a tale for another day. 
Now the Phase 2 cars for the UK market are listed as being available with a 2 litre engine, um, a 16 valve, which was offered with a 5 speed manual or a 4 speed automatic. There is also listed a 3 litre V6 uh, 24 valve engine car, but even looking in the Renault brochures I've yet to find evidence of that car being available in the UK. What we did have though was the engine in this particular vehicle because this car has the 2.5 litre inline five cylinder Volvo engine. Now even though the car is badged as a 2.5, uh, in actual fact the displacement is closer to 2.4 litres um, and it's certainly no fire breather. Um, these were tuned to a leisurely um, 168 horsepower. It's mated to a four speed automatic transmission as well. Now the engine obviously uh, was later turbocharged in Volvos uh, and an incarnation of it then went into the Focus ST as well. But the Safran was never intended to be a hot hatch. In fact, if you wanted a large five door uh, hatchback that was uh, a little bit more dynamic, well you would have probably opted for the Laguna. The Safran is about something entirely different. The Safran is a mile eater. It's designed um, to get you from A to Z in comfort. And I must admit this five cylinder engine does seem to run effortlessly. Um, it pulls away quite nicely on tick over, um, a little more than an idle. In fact, now I'm sat at 60 miles per hour, two and a half thousand RPM. Like I say, it's only a four speed gearbox, but the engine is silent. I can't hear it at all. Um, ride quality, unsurprisingly, is sublime. Um, in fact, I had a Laguna 2, uh, and that car was perhaps one of the nicest cars I've ever owned. Now, I did say there was a Safran that was sold outside the UK, um, which was of notable mention. Now, that was a Phase 1 variant uh, known as the Bi-Turbo. Now, the Bi-Turbo used a 3.0-litre V6 twin-turbocharged engine um, that was lifted from the Alpine A610. Uh, that particular variant also had four-wheel drive. Uh, in terms of power, well, it was producing just shy of 260 horsepower, which by today's standards isn't exactly a huge number. That car did fall short in a few places, though, and didn't sell particularly well, with, I think, around 800 examples uh, being built in total. The Bi-Turbo um, was quite an expensive car, which put it in direct competition with... Um, some of the German offerings. Not only its hefty price, but the car was also only available with a manual transmission, um, which in that segment, um, the majority of cars sold would have been an automatic. Now, the reason I'm told for that car only being available with a manual gearbox is because there was no automatic transmission available at that time that could handle that sort of power with a transverse mounted engine and a four wheel drive system. Today those cars are highly sought after um, and would command quite a premium if you could actually find one available for sale. Now moving around on in, the, um, in a car park, this car does feel huge, very barge like. Out on the open road, well, I wouldn't say it shrinks around you in quite the same way as the Laguna does, um, but it certainly doesn't feel excessively large. In fact, it, um, <laughs> it's a compromise you'd be quite willing to make for such a sublime uh, ride quality around the round right here. I'm actually going to engage a sport mode as well, just see how it picks up. Um, like I said, the car did reach speed quite effortlessly earlier on. That's the foot planted. And there's 60 mile per hour. And we'll just pop it back into normal mode. Um, all very undramatic actually. I mean, yeah, you do get that warble from that five cylinder engine. It is a very nice sounding engine. Um, which for the most part is completely hushed and to be honest even under heavy acceleration um, it weren't all that loud at all but uh, yeah a very nice sounding engine nonetheless um around the roundabout yeah it, it does feel heavier than a laguna but again because the car's so um got a nice long wheelbase and it's such a wide car didn't feel any body roll at all yet the ride was still supremely comfortable 
Now the Phase 1 cars uh, in RXE trim equipped with a 3 litre V6 engine uh, were actually available with a computer controlled suspension system. Um, now I believe that was actually discontinued on these facelift cars and in all honesty um, I can't see why you'd need it, probably just overcomplicated matters. Uh, Renault were actually um, very conservative, very restrained uh, in the d design of the Safran, something which um, completely went out of the window with this car's replacement. Um, so to have a suspension system like that um, was perhaps one of the only French, um, in fact almost Citroen-like um, in its conception. Now I would imagine on a motorway this is the kind of car that you could probably find yourself sitting at a uh, higher speed than you think you're travelling on account of how incredibly quiet it is in here. I mean you could hold a conversation without raising your voice. In fact, I imagine you could probably whisper and still be heard. Now John who's loaned me this car today, um, I believe he's had a 25 before and I know he's certainly had another Safran before this. Um, and I can see why he, he likes these vehicles. Um, incredibly composed, it's like you're on another planet. I mean, it's hard to believe driving along here that this car is now approaching its 25th year. Well, this car rides incredibly well, gear changes are completely seamless, and this uh, Renault flagship really does show that Renault had a serious commitment to quality, um, and we're really on top of the game with this car. I'm hoping we'll have some more reviews coming up and I'll certainly have some more event coverage coming up as well. Um, so make sure you hit that subscribe button and the bell notification to make sure you don't miss any of those future videos that will be coming. Um, perhaps you've got an interesting car yourself that you think would make for a good review. Um, if so, drop me an email, markonmotoring at yahoo.com. I myself am based in Yorkshire, so uh, anywhere in that uh, vicinity um, we could arrange to meet up and do a review. All that remains to be said is, until next time, it is goodbye from me, and thank you for watching. <laughs>